Good evening, all, and welcome to the Health and Welfare Subcommittee. As co-chair of the Health and Welfare Subcommittee of the African American Task Force, and in accordance with the passage of House Concurrent Resolution 85, adopting rules of procedure for conducting virtual meetings of the General Assembly and its legislative committees during an emergency, this public body is authorized to meet virtually. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to House Concurrent Resolution 85. We are utilizing Zoom webinar for this virtual meeting. All members of the Health and Welfare Subcommittee have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through this platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously listen and participate in this meeting by registering via the meeting link that is posted on the General Assembly's website. The public has access to watch and listen to this meeting through a live stream available on YouTube. A link to this live stream can be located on the General Assembly's website or by searching for the, General, the Delaware General Assembly YouTube channel. Should any subcommittee member experience technical difficulties during this meeting, please call 302-415-4433. Public comment is permitted at the close of this meeting. Public attendees in the Zoom webinar must utilize the raise hand function to be permitted to speak and shall be called on in the order in which their hands are raised. Members of the public will be unmuted and informed that they've been allotted two minutes to speak. Public comments can also be submitted in advance of and up to 24 hours after this meeting by emailing African American Task Force at Delaware.gov. In the event that the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that any votes that may be taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's begin today's meeting by taking a roll call attendance of the subcommittee members present. Subcommittee members shall ensure that their cameras remain on for the entirety of the meeting to the best of their ability. When your name is called, please unmute your device and affirm your attendance. Once you've been recorded as present, please mute your device for the duration of the roll call. Representative Melissa Minor Brown. Present. Representative Kendra Johnson. Present. Ray Jones Avery. Dr. Carmen Jordan Cox. Present. Dr. Eleanor Kiesel. Present. Simone Philpotts. Dr. Debbie Harrington. Present. Cassandra Codes Johnson. Present. Forrest Watson. Present. Keith Hunt. Dr. Nakisha Williams Bailey. State Treasurer Colleen Davis. State Auditor Kathy McGinnis. Present. Lucretia Young. Present. Representative Lambert. I see that Darlene Cox from the Office of the Straight State Treasurer had raised her hand. Um, I believe she may be serving as a proxy. I'm going to allow her to speak to verify whether that's the case. Darlene, you should be able to speak. Yes, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, Treasurer Davis will be joining. She just had a prior meeting and it may be running a few minutes late. So I just wanna let you know, she is coming. Wonderful, and thank I you so much. Uh, Madam Co-Chairs, we do have a quorum. Thank you, Caitlin. With the quorum being present, each subcommittee member's identity has been authenticated by the chair. Let's refer to the agenda item number one. Acceptance of 121 uh, minute meeting minutes. 
uh, we will run through the roll again to get the acceptance of the minutes. Are there any questions, concerns, objections to the meeting minutes from January 21st? Okay, rep rep I accept. Representative Kendra Johnson. I, I don't have anything to add. So I'm sorry, are we accepting the meeting minutes or are we going to go ahead and do our roll call? We're doing the roll call to accept the minutes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, yes. <laughs> Uh, Ray Jones Avery. Someone here. Dr. Carmen Jordan Cox. Aye. Dr. Eleanor Kiesel. Aye. Simone Philpotts. Dr. Debbie Harrington. Aye. Dr. Cassandra Coase Johnson. Aye. Forrest Watson. Aye. Keith Hunt, Dr. Nakisha Williams-Bailey, State Treasurer Colleen Davis, State Auditor Kathy McGinnis. Aye. Lucretia Young. Aye. And Representative Lambert. Okay, so we have accepted the meeting minutes from January 21st. Let's move on to the next item on the agenda, and I will uh, pass it over to Representative Johnson so that we can discuss the next agenda item. Wonderful, thank you, Representative Minor Brown. So uh, subcommittee members, we all know that this evening is our very first listening session, so we're a little excited. Uh, the listening session is, as you can see, is gonna be an eviction presentation. So please uh, bear with me while I provide you all with a intro uh, of this evening's presenters. Our speakers this evening are Ryan Harrington and Hector Maldonado, excuse me, Maldonado Reese. They join us from the Delaware Data Lab, Data Innovation Lab. The lab is a nonprofit formed last November through a grant from Newcastle County. It focus is its focus is to work on community challenges in Delaware using data science in innovative ways. Their project specifically reviewed the issues of housing and security. Please allow me to present to you Ryan Harrington and Hector Maldonado Reese. Thank you, Representative Johnson and Representative Brown. And thank you to the African-American Task Force Subcommittee on Health and Welfare and so many members of the General Assembly for having us tonight. My name is Ryan Harrington and I lead the data science team at the Delaware Data Innovation Lab or the DDIL or the lab. You'll hear it referred to as all of those tonight. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, Hector Maldonado Reese, who will introduce himself later. Um, as Representative Johnson mentioned, over the past several months, the lab has been had the opportunity to explore eviction filings in Delaware and their relationship with the various moratoria put in place as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Tonight, we'll tell you that story in a few parts. And I'm not sure if the slides are being presented. Would you like me to share my screen with the slides? That would be wonderful, thank you. Okay, I will put them up now, thank you. No problem, sorry. As she's doing that, um, I can get started and tell you what we'll be looking at. And if you just go right to the second slide, that would be wonderful. So we'll be telling you this story in a few parts. Um, first, I think just for context, I wanna fill in a little bit of the gaps on what the DDIL is and what we do. Um, but then we'll dive right into the world of evictions and we'll tell you about what we did, why we did it, 
We'll talk about some of the practical implications of that. And from our perspective, having done some of this work, what do we see as being some of those next steps? And if we move on to the next slide. So as Representative Brown mentioned, the DDIL is a very young organization. We were founded in November through CARES Act funding provided by County Executive Matt Meyer and his team at Newcastle County. And really the genesis of it came from this idea that there's power in data. As the pandemic began, so many people and so many organizations were working across a ton of different facets from housing and security to food and security to economic stability in order to help people in the community. And we felt that that could be augmented. Um, if you move to the next slide. We felt that it could be augmented by data analysts, by data engineers, by data scientists who could come together to work on community challenges with a focus of increasing innovation, collaboration, and diversity. In order to accomplish that, we had to put together a cohort of talent. If you move to the next slide. So we brought together a cohort of 10 people um, 10 fellows, all from across the greater Philadelphia region and some beyond reaching as far out as Austin coming to work on this project here. They represented a wide variety of talents and lived experiences so that they could do this work. And they were organized into what we called pods, if you move on to the next slide. Those tackled a pretty wide variety of challenges. So on one hand, wastewater and the efficacy of understanding viral loads um, as it relates to COVID. You'll hear tonight about evictions. We discussed FAFSA, city place well-being through city indicators, um, the effect on the hospitality industry, and how to put that all together, which you'll see a little bit tonight using augmented and virtual reality as well. And you can actually fast forward a couple of slides. Ultimately, ultimately we'll be showing you evictions tonight, but in the future, um, you'll actually be hearing about the FAFSA project and the city indicators or the Healthy Places Index project. And with that being said, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Hector Maldonado-Reese, who can really tell you about the eviction story itself. Um, Hector. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. Good evening, everyone. And thank you to Representative Johnson and Brown for having us. And I echo all of Ryan's words. Um, just, uh, I, I know that there's a lot of information that we're going to be presenting to you today, but just so you know, uh, we, our intention is to share these slides so you can have them and pause and there are links that you can actually access throughout it. So with that being said, if it's great to go, um, we'll just get started. Um, we'll get started with a bit of a summary of what we'll be talking about today. So in big picture, um, like Ryan mentioned, we, we took an approach of um, top down in terms of just exploring what the um, circumstance on evictions and, and housing as a security as a whole is here in Delaware. In order to do that, we started with an approach of understanding both an exploration of the literature, but also the data that's available throughout um, nationally, but also um, in the state. Um, that led us to build um, individual interactive narratives. Now we'll get to that a little bit later, but these are sort of dynamic interactive narratives that we hope can reach a larger audience about this particular eviction crisis. Um, and from those interactions, what we really took were big pictures were that at the census track level, we did this analysis um, in the Newcastle County area and we identified a disproportionate distribution of eviction filings, um, both historically and throughout 2020. And um, similarly, um, we found that that distribution clustered more pro pro with a higher frequency towards communities or census tracts or neighborhoods that are largely um, neighborhoods where the race or ethnicity majority group are Black or Latinx in the county. So all that being said, in terms of like what our bigger picture next steps could be, are aiming to extend this analysis that we conducted for Newcastle County to the other counties. Um, and mentioning that because that data was just only recently made available for the additional counties in 2021. Um, and long term, we, we really understand is that under particularly the issue under housing and security, an obvious next step for this work would be to overlay this information with housing assistance data, kind of understanding where the needs and the demands are to target those resources um, in, in, in big picture. And we can go on to the next slide, please. Awesome, great. So I, I, we wanted to give you a bit of a perspective with some detail, of course, of, of the bigger picture of eviction crisis um, 
and nationally, but in Delaware as a whole. So I think that for us, it could be quite uh, possible to imagine both clinical and non-clinical mechanisms by which eviction and COVID-19 could be correlated. Um, and an individual that is at risk of or facing an eviction um, or the end their family might make many decisions to move in with family members, friends, shelter in a public space. Um, many circumstances that throughout a pandemic just exacerbate much of the uh, detrimental health and well-being uh, um, outcomes that are associated with housing. One of the things that we really want to point out is that an eviction can span not only from physical and emotional trauma, but also to mental and financial trauma, not only creating a cyclical issue, but also promoting the particular issue that is happening right now throughout a period of a moratorium. Uh, and a big picture, um, of course, an eviction affects a tenant, but many times tenants have families with them in these houses, um, with them in their homes. But particularly in the context of a social pandemic, an individual being at risk of eviction also poses a concern for the community at large. Um, and I think that this is one of those challenges that we continue to see because as the scheduled term to the eviction moratoria continues to be shifted, um, kind of like our involvement and how we respond to it, it gets more and more complicated regarding the accruing cases and counts that are happening throughout time. So we can go to the next slide, please. And, and that leads us to this next slide. And, 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 and I think that one of the things that we wanna point out is that for this particular analysis, we'll be discussing eviction filings and, and why filings over evictions, we'll get to that in a minute, but I just wanna talk about filings and what they are and how they apply right now. So an eviction filing in the state of Delaware and broadly is both a necessary step, it is a necessary step in any legally processed eviction, regardless of its outcome. So we say legally process because we understand that not all evictions result through a legal judicial process by which an individual chooses to leave. Um, we, we, we also understand that because it is a legal process, there are many implications financially that tenants and landlords, um, whether the circumstances warranted or justified might have to go through. Um, so that being said, understanding that an eviction filing doesn't guarantee an eviction, we do know that there is a correlation that the more likely, uh, the higher count of eviction filings the census track experiences, the higher the potential, the, the, the likelihood that one of those filings will turn into a eviction process itself. Um, one of the things that it's big picture of the moratoria has been the fact that um, civil evictions have been paused. And that being said, the courts have reopened throughout some periods after the summer, but one particular circumstance is that really defining what a civil eviction, especially throughout a period of a, of a pandemic, what constitutes that and to what extent the, the supports are in place. Um, but big picture, we know that although there is a moratoria on evictions, that protection didn't necessarily extend to filings. So filings can in a way tell us about a distribution of burden that has happened both historically, but that we can also expect in some shape, way or form. Um, or uh, um, uh, appreciate uh, that might come forward. Um, next slide, please. So to that extent, um, what we really found useful was putting in perspective a picture of what that timeline of eviction has looked like, um, both broadly in the nation, but in, I think that in Delaware particularly, we can also incorporate a lot of this information. There's been three large periods that we're kind of categorizing. There is that state level involvement um, in that light indigo blue towards the left side, um, where the state really just, the courts were closed. There were physical and operational decisions that were made. And then there's a period where the courts reopened to handle either accruing cases um, of filings or state evictions uh, processes from the past. Um, and then lastly, in the CDC's eviction moratorium. That period, um, as I'm mentioning in an order from left to right, started on around the March period, we're calling that loosely the beginning of the pandemic period um, with, state, uh, with the state moratorium on eviction and then housing uh, assistance following that. And throughout that different periods where the courts reopen um, and the state moratorium on eviction ends, leaving that period of not necessarily uh, absence involvement, but more different involvement um, later on in September, the CDC guidelines uh, on the eviction uh, moratoria, which were up to the states to update um, those the guidelines from the CDC. And this moving forward all the way until most recently on January 20th, when President Biden has extended the eviction moratorium until March 2021. 20, uh, so that big picture is that, to that, be, that said, is that we're almost at a year since this process has kind of started organizing in terms of the different timelines of the eviction moratoria. Um, next slide, please. So 
that's sort of the eviction perspective and picture. Um, like we said, there there is an eviction filing, there are evictions, there's moratorias, but really all of this um, from a perspective of data only um, applies to us in many ways in terms of access and availability of data. Um, what we've learned through this process is that on a national scale for the most part, um, what we've understood is that access to eviction data is very much limited um, and, and, and it's not just the access, it's the availability of it. Um, and one of the major sources of uh, aggregate level eviction data is the eviction lab at Princeton University and that's the data that we've chosen to analyze for this particular visualization. Um, we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but one of the things that is that is one of those complications is the fact that what the data that's publicly available for the pandemic period is on filings, not on evictions. So we are not really able to understand how these uh, correlations, although we know they're associated, just how much they really converge to each other. This we mentioned because uh, a large scale, it is, it is possible to understand that in a moment where we're trying to create transformative progress, especially in the housing sector and security sector, the access to the data um, that helps us target our resources and drive it, it, it really just creates a barrier for that change that we're trying to cause. Um, and, and, and like we mentioned earlier, this, this data that was made available um, originally was only covering the Newcastle County area. So it wasn't until 2021 recently, um, this year, that the Kent County, uh, Kent County and Sussex County data has been made extensively available. Um, that all being said, evictions are complicated and, and, and I'm sure that that's generally understood. But I think that because the circumstances that cause or drive evictions vary so much by the, by, by the individual tenant and landlord dynamic and interaction, but also spatially, geographically, family circumstances, employment, there's a lot of things that go into play into an eviction. So it is both a complex but important um, issue to, to tackle and, and address. And, and, and that's kind of where we're at with understanding that the data is limited, but also we're trying to take and gather information from what's available. Um, next slide, please. So all that being said, it's kind of like the setup for why we, we undertook this project. The reasons are pretty much what we've understood as main points of both a tangential to the COVID-19 pandemic issue, but also just systematically and historically existing issue. So it's both an, an issue that has come from past time, but also is being exacerbated and, and, and magnified throughout the pandemic in many ways. Uh, we know for a fact that we can understand different perspectives to an issue, but the eviction, um, the eviction crisis itself, uh, it, it is detrimental to health it, in, in any shape or form, whether it's through a person's inability to, let's say quarantine, or the ability to social distance if they need to, or quarantine, or be able to stay with their families and choose to respond to, any, uh, to, to the pandemic in the best way that they are able and capable housing and homes really allow individuals some of that freedom and protections to be able to do that. Um, we know that the eviction problem largely, we, we hear much of the issues faced by tenants, but we also um, understand that landlords faced much challenges throughout the pandemic. Not every single landlord necessarily has to stand from a property management group or have multiple homes. This could be a livelihood, I and mean, it is for many individuals. So it really, like, like we're mentioning, there is many parties in play in a circumstance that just complicates the understanding of the problem without some sort of guidance. Uh, we also recognize that an eviction can happen to anyone but we, we cannot be put to assume that it is equally distributed and that it affect, they affect everyone equally. And I think that that's really where we're coming from, understanding that that distribution is, uh, the narrative of how that's happening is important to understand, just see and, 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 and just know for moving forward. Um, and lastly, I think that the reason the major picture uh, take home uh, takeaway is that during a pandemic, both the risks and consequences associated with an eviction are much largely magnified um, in the context of uh, contracting and spreading COVID locally. And I say locally because of course we know that these issues of, um, of spreading of the virus um, at different sizing and levels, but in context of eviction, individuals tend to move with family members at their home. They stay to stay in lo local distances or short distances. So this is something to keep in mind in terms of how one thing leads into another. And I think that we can go to the next slide, please. So uh, what we did and why, and we can go to the next slide actually. Um, 
So those were sort of the justifications as to what we were doing. And, and really what we wanted to do was we built an interactive narrative and those interactive narratives tells you, and this is an example on the right on this picture of one of them and we'll get to it. Um, but essentially what we wanted to do was create a circumstance where an individual would be able to interact with the data in a more natural way, be able to stop, understand, read, and really appreciate what was being described in that picture by also like providing uh, some, some helpful visuals that will be able to guide some of that interaction. Um, and this particular visual is helpful to, we used it to uh, visualize data on filings, eviction filings historically and in 2020 in Newcastle County. And we can go on to the next slide, please. So in general, um, we did this to highlight the disproportionate distribution of filings. But what we really want to highlight is that this is at the granular level, right? So this is at a census tract level. It's not just the three counties that compose less than 1 million individuals. It is on a more granular level at the census tract. What can we really identify and where is that clustering happening? Um, the main focus for doing this was also to target not only a broader population, but engage that population um, to encourage future data approaches, but also along the way while encouraging future work, encouraging collaboration and, 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 and broader um, work, also identifying communities at risk of experiencing eviction surges on the opposite side of the moratoria. So through this exploration of data, we get to know the circumstance, but also pr pr promote um, some actionable change through some of these findings. Um, we can go on to the next slide, please. So like I mentioned, one of our first products that we've been working on since uh, we joined in November has been this augmented reality version of the eviction final distribution. Intentionally, this is meant to be a, an, a presentation that I walked through. So it would be something that I would actually like manage on my own, but given the nature of the presentation, we've created a video. But if you see this public access link, it's something that you can pause on this slide and type or write down. It is completely shareable. So any individual that wants to access it can. There is a hyperlink on the bottom of the slide, um, sort of explaining what you're about to open in that link and how to use it and, and such. But we just want to point out also that um, you can use it from a computer or phone, um, access and interact with the data. But if you use a phone, there's also an augmented reality version where you can promote and kind of like project the, uh, the maps and the data into like your living room or outside space and walk through it with your camera looking through it. So it engages uh, the individuals a bit more. Um, the next slide, like I mentioned, is it, it, it's sort of a video of what you would typically see and we would walk you through. So unfortunately, I can't stop and point out some of the details, but what we're hoping is that this video captures all of the narrative that's composed in there. But we really encourage you to, like we said, this is something that you can go in and work and, and talk and process. And every single one of these steps or slides will have this bot text box, which is what we're, uh, it's a summary of what each picture is showing. Um, essentially so that you can work around, but always go back to that and say, oh, okay, this is what this image is telling me visualizing, but then you can also make your own uh, conclusion from there. So if we wanna play with this, yeah. let's start off. So essentially what we're showing you here before we get started is uh, in Does one you will see a map of Newcastle County, Delaware. I will be moving around this image. Um, so I'll be showing different parts of the, of the data. On this axis here, you'll see some data plotted for all this date axis is the last week of April all the way to the last week of November. And on this side of the graph- I'm sorry, Sophia, would we be able to increase the volume? Let me try one okay. moment. Another data that will be is from the eviction lab of Queens and Unicorn. Uh, just to offer another solution, um, what if we muted the volume and Hector, what if you just actually tried to talk over it? I know it's probably harder, but I bet your voice comes through a lot clearer. You're muted, so you, we can't hear you though. Sorry, thank you. Um, yeah, sure, we could do that as well. Um, that's, uh, that's perfectly fine as well. So if you wanna just play the video and mute it, I can, well, I can voice over as well. Or sure, sorry about that, thank you. No, you're fine. University is publicly available. Um, so let me see if I can catch up with myself. Um, this image here, like, like I was mentioning, where it's just data on Newcastle County um, and it's available through the eviction lab. So this first image, um, like I mentioned, a map is on the left side and on the right is data. 
um, on eviction filings historically. In this case, historically is the eviction filings that are averaged between 2016 and 2019. A darker color of eviction filings means a lower count. A, higher, a, a lighter green color means a higher count. What you can see is that when you look at all those census tracts in, or neighborhoods in Newcastle County, the distribution of those eviction filings historically is not necessarily smooth. So that means that it depends on where you live and it varies greatly on where you live. Now, um, that same data, right, we're seeing these differentials on the uh, sums of these eviction filings. But on the left side of this image, what we're also showing is a map of Newcastle County overlaying that data. So that spatial distribution of the data gives us a little bit more information. And this is just a detail that this, because this is an interactive augmented reality, you can actually click those individual census tracts and their information will highlight. So you can actually interact with the data when you're in the link itself if you want to inspect it individually. Um, but in that map, what you see there as well is like a small cluster around the Wilmington City proper area. And that's that little white peak um, next uh, sort of below the Delaware Data Innovation Lab um, logo. And next to it is a new art area. So we do know that that's sort of what's happened historically. But then in this next image, we also wanted to talk about 2020 and how did those filings look like? Um, so in blue, in this case, instead of green, a darker blue means the lower count of eviction filings, a lighter blue means a higher count. Now, same similar kind of this, this uh, picture, but we know that it's not as smooth. So although it's it, every census tract kind of is experiencing its own count and cr accruement of eviction filings, it varies, but not as much as we saw historically. And of course, we know that that has much to do with the fact that there is an eviction moratorium in place, regardless of whether or not it protects filings. But the one thing is that we know that that clustering around Newcastle, uh, Wilmington City proper area still persists, even with the 2020 filings. Uh, however, an additional layer to this is that we're now putting a color background to what those filings look like. So on the left side there, that indigo blue, we see that there really are no filings throughout that period where the state moratoria involvement was in. But then the moment that the courts reopen, we start seeing the filings count and grow towards the point of where that lime green is the CDC's moratorium on eviction. And that's where the highest counts on eviction now are, are growing. Regardless of the moratoria, these are filings. So they will continue to, to, to grow and count and the probabilities of them turning into an eviction are just gonna continue to grow. Now, all that being said, I'm not sure if it'll go forward there. Yeah, all that being said, um, so those are two pictures, 20, 2020 and historical, but we wanted to put it in one perspective. So now what we're doing is that we're putting in green 20 uh, historical values of evictions by census tract and in blue 2020 values. What you're seeing there is that every neighborhood observed lower counts of eviction filings throughout the pandemic period um, in 2020. Um, that being said, it, it, some grew closer to what they historically do, but they all were well below that. Now, this gives us an opportunity to evaluate sort of a two-part issue that is happening, which is there is a historical issue, and then there's a 2020 issue that is happening right at the same place. Um, and I think it'll go there. Yeah. And that's what we're showing you here. So what we've taken here is that difference. So we took the value for 20 uh, historically and we subtracted the difference in 2020. And that's that range that you're seeing there. What you're seeing is that some neighborhoods to the left of this graph have a really small range of eviction filings, both historically and during 2020, right? But then some neighborhoods towards the right have a larger range of eviction filings. It's kind of saying about, we are not calling them protected evictions, we're calling them unobserved evictions from what we expect to see historically in those census tracts. Now. Um, the idea is that a larger count of this unobserved eviction filings tells us about a risk factor within a community on the opposite side of the eviction uh, moratoria and leading up to towards it, for example. Hoping that it'll go forward. Now, and, and I think that one of the things that we did next did to this was that we, we wanted to understand really from the data that's available, what are some of the overlaying population level factors that we can add to this information? So not only do we know that the distribution varies depending on the census tract. Um, wondering where I am in that video. Um, but I think that, there we go, that's what I was waiting for. Um, but not only do we know that the distribution uh, varies by, by where you're located in the census tract, but there's other factors that sort of both historically and systemically have affected this. So what we're doing here is that that same difference, we just brought it down. And now what we're showing you is the same uh, difference, but overlaid by the neighborhood's largest race or ethnicity group. Um, and what you'll see is that towards the left side of this graph, those census tracts that had a really small range of eviction filings happen to be more frequently 
non-Hispanic white populations uh, majority census tract, whereas the populations that have those largest ranges on eviction filings to the right happen to be neighborhoods or census tracts that are largely Black, Latinx, or other um, uh, descriptive um, largest neighborhood race and ethnicity group um, within Newcastle County. And I think that that's where the video probably pauses. Yeah. So overall, this is in, in essence, it's a, like we mentioned, this is something that you can go back to and, and, and it moves and you can step through and have conversations and pause and identify different individuals. We've included the census tracts to each one of these. So in case you're a stakeholder that's working on a particular project, on a particular location, or trying to target resources, nonprofits in that area. That's part of what we're hoping to also extend through this. Um, and we can go on the next slide. And I, just to reiter reiterate, this is a completely accessible link. Um, so if you just click that link, you're able to access it and share it with anybody. Um, so that's our that's essentially our augmented reality narrative. And 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 we just we wanted to create the opportunity for having a visual engagement, but also we understand that some individuals prefer to share information with much more text and a little bit more engaged scroll aspect. So we created a different dynamic narrative. Um, this is also hosted. So this link, you can also, as long as you have this link, you have access to it. Um, but in, for the efforts of this presentation, we are just gonna put a very brief, we can go on to the next slide, please. In this particular um, video, it's just a glimpse of what it looks like when you turn it on. Um, and there's no sound on this, so I'll just keep speaking, but um, it is essentially just a scroll experience. So as you're going through, you're going to interact with different maps that you can go in and zoom out and understand what the information is. And the data on the left matches. In this case, for example, is the COVID uh, per capita rate distribution. So there's different circumstances, information, and just a lot more uh, resources to be able to link to and, and gather that information overall. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so that's what the sort of interface looks like for, for that particular uh, narrative. But here's a picture, um, a static picture of what one of those maps looks like. What we're showing you here and highlighting, for example, is the area normalized 2020 eviction filings in the Newcastle County area. That small, really concentric um, region is, again, um, perhaps not surprising at this point, the Wilmington City proper area where every those darker census tracts towards the center of the city have a higher a normalized eviction count um during the 2020 period uh, if you can go to the next slide please similarly in this map i've zoomed a little bit um into this map into the northern newcastle county area um but what we're showing you here is essentially the COVID positive cases per capita at the census track level um distribution throughout right um the one thing that we notice is that small clustering where that concentric cir black circle is showing you that those regions where there are higher frequency counts. Um, and when you see a gray shade in this picture, it does really mean that there was either it's uh, that there's no data available because the cases are so low that they're not reported. Um, so really this is a distribution of some of those, uh, the regionality of Wilmington's because just right next to it, there are still regions where there are no cases reported or they're too low to report. Um, if we can go on to the next slide. Thank you. So all that being said, this was all information at a neighborhood level. That really tells us a big picture of what's happening geographically about the place. Um, but we also would like to know about the individual level, right? As opposed to the neighborhood level. And that's really what we sought out to do and what we're showing you here. So in order to do this, we acquired and sourced data from the Center for Anti-Racist Research at Boston University. Um, they sought out to collect the, I guess, large, uh, the racial and, and ethnic data for COVID related uh, deaths and cases throughout 2020 and currently. Um, what we were able to acquire from them is data on COVID positive cases with 95% completion of race and ethnicity data for the individual and 100% completion for death data um, for COVID um, case. And so what we're showing you here really is that when we're looking at the cumulative counts of COVID on a per capita basis, um, the within the Latinx community and within the Black um, identifying communities, um, over the white identifying communities, self-identifying communities, the, the rates are higher. So although there might be more cases, the burden and, and the, 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 bur the, the rate at which it's happening within those the, the Black and Latinx communities is much higher than that is in the greater uh, Delaware as a whole. And one of the things to distinguishly point out is that Delaware itself is composed of less than 1 million uh, of residents. Uh, and that being said, it is largely skewed to a, a non-Hispanic white 
populist group. So that tells us about the distribution of the burden in that way. Um, next slide, please. So a bunch of information, a bunch of data. And of course, like we said, this is perhaps more uh, impactful taking the time to stop and pause and read some of it. Um, but what does this all really practically imply? And if we can go on to the next slide, please. So we just really wanted to create a, 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 a big picture and kind of recap of what this all means and what is really useful moving forward in our opinions. Um, first and foremost, I just wanted to stop and revisit this concept of unobserved eviction filings. Like we mentioned in the augmented reality, it's sort of like that difference between historical and 2020, but just to put it in picture, it truly is just the magnitude difference between what has happened historically versus what was expect, what was observed during 2020. And the idea there is, okay, if there were 50 of historical eviction filings, but you've only seen 10, then there's 40 potential eviction filings that you're still to observe. So can we use that information to kind of target resource allocation? Um, because of that, um, I think that from all of this information and in that context of unobserved eviction filings, what we really take away is that that risk of experiencing eviction surge on the opposite side of the moratoria was disproportionately distributed in the Newcastle County area, but that that small magnitude really clustered to depending on whether you were in a non-Hispanic white community or, or not. And really, that both tells us about many things on a systematic financial and, and, and level, but it also tells about historically what's occurring in every single one of these census tracts. So if we can go on to the next slide, please. In general, we, 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 we can use eviction filing uh, to understand some of the data and, and, and interpret what are some of the happenings in the state. But we, we also recognize that one of the big picture conclusions from our experience building this whole narrative storyline has been the fact that there is a limited type to the type of data and the access to that data, um, just how limited and accessible it is. Um, and overall, we really, we're basing on the assumption that we understand there's an association, but we really know that innovation finding does not guarantee innovation will occur. So really, that open access experience and the opportunity to advocate for these, this data to be readily available might be a limiting, it might be what's limiting, uh, a limiting rate of intersectional collaboration. So there are many of these complexities that are happening in housing security that will eventually require many individuals coming together from different perspectives um, to, to try and, and, and move this idea forward and not just talk about it, but also see change happen, especially around the idea of equalizing, equalizing housing um, a security, quality, but access overall. So not just one thing, but bigger picture. Um, one, one, one reminder of, of what this all really big picture means is that um, although this, it is beneficial that this data is recorded, but because it is recorded, we're only speaking of the recorded cases. So those cases who are not legally recorded or that are judicially processed, we really have, uh, need to identify new ways to capture those pictures. Um, and lastly, like we just want to reiterate that at the time of analyzing this, the data was originally available for Newcastle County. So now understanding that those resource allocation and how that plays out is really important for understanding the bigger picture of the county. So that's one of our particular focuses is understanding Kent and Sussex County distributions and that's as well. Um, next slide, please. And that's where I laid the next slide, please. Um, so that leads us to sort of our next steps. And like I just mentioned, um, I think that uh, we can all agree that just knowing information on one county when we have now data available on the whole state um, gives us limited perspective of what's happening statewide. So what our next steps and goals are to extend this analysis that we've conducted for Newcastle County at the census track level, but also to incorporate Kent and Sussex County. Not only again, are we going to identify where these burdens and visualize where these burdens can happen to connect individuals with resources, um, and, 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 but also I think that the important aspect is to talk about, well, this is the story of what's been happening. This is how you, this is how it looks and this is where it is. Um, I, I think that overall, um, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, overall, our goal is to just capture this eviction filing, eviction housing and security as best to our abilities and add to the narrative in Delaware as a whole. It is not our intention to only fix to just one county because it is important to represent the whole state and understand all of the whole state. Um, illegal eviction filings. So we've mentioned a few times that not every single eviction file eviction process is legal and 
Um, what we what that really results is in undercounts. So even if we see that an eviction filing count is high in a neighborhood, we really don't know how the unobserved evictions in the sense of people who just do not can, cannot or do or choose to not be involved in an eviction or facing an eviction process. There are many reasons outside of financial for why a person wouldn't want to engage in any type of court process or eviction process. Um, and I think that it's really important to kind of highlight that, it, especially during a pandemic, those can be exacerbated. Um, absolutely. Um, but the big picture question is, are there approaches that we can take to proxy for some of these things? Are there, that's where we are right now, is idealizing, is there a way to utilize data to estimate, to, to, to question if these are things that we can uh, calculate or quantify in shape or way or form? Um, we can go on to our next slide, please. And I think that, um, and this part be our last slide, and then we, we, we're happy to discuss, um, but I think that our most immediate next step that makes sense is that because eviction filings and evictions affect renters, um, that we overlay this information to renter housing assistance data in the state. Not only will we understand how this correlation between eviction filings plays out at a census tract level with who uptook the uh, housing assistance, but it can also help us understand that there might be places who might not need that assistance and it can be further reallocated to the places that do. Um, on that end, it also can create a space um, for conversation about the reality is that individuals are at risk of facing an eviction or facing one um, because of many reasons, but those reasons exist, whether they're financial, they can't pay rent, health reasons, COVID-19 itself, it really is just so complex that we can't just say this one reason caused it, but we do know that there are reasons. So even if there is a moratoria, those reasons are still in place. And if they're not removed and those barriers aren't addressed, we're just extending the possibility of an individual accruing debt, for example, throughout a longer period without the necessary uh, support before that happens. Um, but in order, by doing this and hopefully overlaying this data, our goal is to not like better understand geographical up, uptake, but, but also I think that giving a better perspective of who in Delaware needs what right now. And I think that that's a really big, big takeaway from all of this work, that regardless of whether this is systemic, historic, present, current, population level, financial, mental, financial health, whatever it really, the reasons, we really just know the action and data need to be taken forward. And, and, and that's sort of our, our, our summary of, of, of the narrative. And like we mentioned, we really think that the best out of this would be for y'all to take the time to, if, if, you, if you can, to access these links and, and generate your own questions and add your own conclusions and, and information and merge ideas. Um, but with that being said, I think that that pretty much concludes um, the presentation that we have for you. Wow, Hector. Wow. Um, so full disclosure, uh, I'm a bit of a uh, data geek, like because it tells stories. And I like those kind of stories when you can, you can back it up, you know, with with the evidence versus me telling you a really, really wonderful story. So um, that, that was really heavy. That was really heavy. And I know for certain what I am going to have to do because it was a lot, I am gonna to have to go back through your, your presentation and I will definitely take the time to click on the link so that I have a more comprehensive understanding. I took a whole page of, of really good nuggets. So thank you. I feel like you kind of gave me the, what you, what you, uh, the Cliff Notes version, okay? You gave me the Cliff Notes versions. And, and now I'm going to take this and I'm going to dig deeper. So I really look forward to, to clicking the links and learning more. Um, I will open it up for uh, Q&A from our members and our distinguished guests. What I will ask you to do, just so that I can, you know, or maybe someone will help me. Um, I will ask that you raise your hand. I actually have the participants list up. So if you raise your hand, then I will be, wait, did I move too quickly? I'm sorry, did I jump, Sophia? 
No, you're doing well. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> I'm a little too excited. Huh? I'm like, let's talk this over. Um, so what I'll do is I will look at the participant list and based on what I see here, I will um, give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have of Hector and Ryan. But before I get to that, what I wanted to say is this, as I, I, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm taking my notes, it's, I'm like, wow, how interesting to find, well, interesting and sad at the same time, to learn that when you started this journey, the eviction data was only available for Newcastle County. So that for me was, was kind of startling. I'm glad that you have some information now. And my hope is that we keep it going so that we can continue to look at these things. And like you said, you know, be able to identify who needs help based on, on the um, data. The, the last thing I will say to my uh, committee members is this. As I listened, it may have been early on in the slide, I wrote down physical, emotional, mental, financial trauma. And that was actually in one of your slides. And in that moment, I was like, oh my goodness, these are, each of those are, um, our work groups, right? And we also know, we understand the interconnectedness of all things. And while we identified housing as an area that we should further research and, and create a work group around, you know, also understanding that housing insecurity is associated with your emotional well-being, your mental well-being, your financial, you know, well-being, and, and your physical well-being. And I just, I just had that moment. I'm like, holy moly! I just never. While I know that, I just never saw it or heard it just articulated in that moment to just make me stop and just realize that it's. It's about so much more than just housing. And I just think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So with that, I will stop and I will um, look at our participants list and see who has their hand. Oh, oh, wait, I see Eleanor, she has her hand up already. So Eleanor, please speak. This was a great presentation. Um, as a former community legal aid attorney, <laughs> it really is, um, is nice to see the resources being put in um, into data analysis in, in so many um, uh, in different directions. I mean, I know that you were looking primarily at eviction filings as opposed to court ordered evictions, but I hope too that you're gonna have the opportunity to look at the disparity between landlords re being represented by an attorney and tenants not, and the huge disparity there is with orders of eviction in those cases. Um, in Delaware, landlords can have non-attorney advocates represent them. Um, and that is through a you know apartment manager or a professional um, who doesn't need to be an attorney can represent um, a landlord, but that is not offered to tenants. So um, there just is such a huge percentage of, of people um, that go into a situation where the landlord is represented by an attorney and they're done, they're just done. And as the representative Johnson was just saying, you know, our social determinants of health include homelessness. So it's not just one issue, um, it's multiple issues. And I hope that um, we start to look at the disparity of legal um, representation when we're looking at landlord tenant matters and eviction matters because they're crucial. You know, uh, someone gets evicted from a uh, public housing and they've got a five year bar and they're in poverty already. There's no way they're gonna afford a marketable rent so um, the work is really important and thanks for presenting. 
Well, thank you, Eleanor. Up next, we have uh, Colleen Davis. Colleen. Hi, good evening. Thank you guys so much for presenting. You know, there's a couple of things I think about. Um, I really appreciate the data and, and I think that's, it's extremely important to have in order to start thinking about a plan of attack and how, how we truly support people. Um, one of the things I think about is um, all the job losses, right? Uh, we expect that there's a certain percentage of current job losses that are permanent. And that's sort of, in my mind, the beginning of whether or not folks have the ability to remain in their housing. Um, one of the things that, you know, I'm, I'm sure you touched on, but the moratorium on evictions ends, uh, you know, in a month, right? And, um, and that, that date is fast approaching and for uh, many vulnerable individuals and families, um, it, it is a, a looming deadline. Um, and it's one of the reasons that we have, uh, I myself and, and others have been reaching out to our federal delegation to, to sort of underscore why continued stimulus is extremely important. I, I wonder if, you guys have have tied together some of the um, you know expected permanent job loss and and whether whether these are going to be individuals that are going to need not just some housing support but you know continued support to sort of get back into the economy effectively um, and and to to live productive lives again. Um, so so. I don't, I know that might be a tough question, but I'm just curious if you have any data um, around that sort of matching jobs and permanence. Um, no, sure. Thank you for your question. It's a really great question. No, I think that part of what you're, you're suggesting is the, the, the kind of also space that we've considered, um, not just, not necessarily on the sense of permanent job loss, but just job loss and what types of markets have been the most affected in, in that way. Um, I, I, I don't know, we don't really have a, the incorporation of, of job loss data that's permanent. I think that along with like the eviction data, one of the things that are most challenging is that granularity, right? Because it becomes a challenge of like, because we're doing these analysis at the census track level, because we want to get a more precise estimate, we lose that like, well, it's not at the county level, it's not at the state level. So I'm not really sure exactly on the available uh, job, permanent job loss data, but at least until now, we haven't really incorporated that data, but that would be something that we could definitely kind of like connect on later on and speak on towards more for sure. Any other things that you might want to add, Ryan, to that? No, Hector, I think you covered it well. Um, I do want to touch on, you mentioned the point about stimulus and the need for ongoing stimulus. Besides that, um, I do want to recognize Marlena Gibson joined. Um, we had the opportunity to present this to her and the Delaware State Housing Authority last week. Um, and that was one of the pieces that we were talking about was just how can we take this to the next level and overlay what rental assistance has already been given out um, on top of this work to get a better understanding of where, where those interventions have been put in place, are those the, the places they should be, essentially. Um, so I can't add too much to the permanent job loss piece, but wanted to touch on that point as well. Thank you again for the question. Thank you. Up next, we have Mr. Forrest Watson. Um, thank you all. I mean, uh, this was uh, very powerful, um, I, and I couldn't help but to think about the individuals that have uh, devoted their time to investigate and analyze and, and, and present. Uh, I know Ryan and, and um, Hector are here uh, as the voices, but there are probably so many others behind the scene who has contributed to this. And I'm thankful that you guys are in this space um, and bringing this to our attention. Uh, what's hidden usually can uh, do a lot of damage. And so if we can get it exposed, at least we can confront it and uh, attempt to address many of the issues. But I've got several things I wanna talk about. Uh, one, I'm curious as you, uh, you, you evaluated your evictions, um, 
we're, we're and, and, and this is um, coming from a person in, in, with some naivety, na, na, uh, naiveness over this, is, is are those evictions, well, first I, I look at evictions as an eviction from, from some housing. And, and in that regard, there, there's homeowners and then there's renters. And, and to me, have you broken it down in that category and looked at the disparity between homeowner evictions and renters too? Uh, I would I would venture to say the disparity is probably similar or even more exasperated if it was just particular home or homeowners and renters. That's the first question. Uh, two, and I'm curious to know, uh, you know why Kent and Sussex counties uh, 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 data wasn't really available to us until January 9th of this year. Um, uh, it, that that's telling to me, but I'd like. Uh, some, you know, maybe some some thoughts around that from you guys. Number one uh, on on the, uh, the Kent and Sussex County issue, and number two under that, I'd like to see some analysis of that. I particularly think that would be telling as well. Uh, and third, uh, and and it, it is this this concept, and I think Eleanor probably hit it on the head. Um, the pathway to citizenship and equal protection under the law. And is, is that, an, to me, I think that's what we've been endeavoring to do for many, many years in this country uh, for it, people, uh, people of color and even more expressed in terms of our Latinx people coming from the South and how that might be an impactful way, how that may have impact the number of, of of evictions that we have, uh, because it doesn't seem like a, a real expression of, of, of citizenship in terms of equal protections under the law, as Eleanor has indicated. So, um, and then my final, my final piece, well, no, I'll leave it like that. I'd just like to see what you guys think about those three things. Yeah, sure. No, I appreciate the questions. Let me see if I captured them uh, correctly. Please correct me if there's something that I missed. But um, the first one was your question was sort of like taking out this concept of homeowner versus renter uh, burden. So what I'll add to that is that um, the evictions themselves only affect renters. Um, on the homeowner side, it would be a foreclosure, right? So although that we would like to have access to that data, it's just not data that's made available through the eviction lab. Um, because they focus on the eviction uh, part of, I, I guess, home ownership versus renter perspective. So that's that, that, I'll say that about that. Um, I do agree with you that it is probably a similar rates, very likely. I think that um, we can, like I was mentioning earlier, we kind of moved around housing insecurity and talked much about renter insecurity, but there's also a tenant and land, like landlord and other types of circumstances, um, just owner ownership issues. Um, uh, that's that on, on that part, um, but please let me know if that's missing. But then in terms of, uh, like I mentioned the data lab. So the Newcastle County data, I think that this is a function of many things and I can't speak for them. I'll just tell you what I think that it could be uh, something that I could justify it. As a, I just know that this data has a lag period as well. But in general, um, one of the things is that we are accessing data from Delaware through a separate entity. <laughs> so the fact that we have that we are not directly able to, there is a docket in the state, but the fact that we can't directly access this data already readily available through the state just already creates a, a, a one degree of directionality, which is one of those opportunities of advocacy, because like I was mentioning, that's a really strong place. If we can have this data, we can get to more conclusions sooner. We don't have to wait for it to be made readily available. Um, of course, there's just so much that's being processed, and sometimes that could take a play in it for sure. Um, I, uh, to your point of, of yes, analysis, that's sort of where we're in our current steps. Um, and we're in the mix of just involving that analysis and see, seeing how this sort of extrapolates to both Sussex and Kent County. For, for sure, that's one of our next steps. Um, and I think that that's kind of like the, the, the three pictures, but also I just wanted to point out to the pathways to citizenship. I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not particularly sure that we have any, any particular insights yet on, on anything that we can contribute there. I'd be open to hearing any other thoughts that you might have on that. But what I would say is that one of the reasons that I was mentioning earlier that we can talk about reasons and why an individual would not want to get involved in an eviction process is one of these, this is one of them. The fact is that not everybody has the luxury capability or ability to be involved in the same way and be impacted in the same way by this process. So recognizing that, um, I think that kind of ties in, in in some way to what you're suggesting in, in that sense. But 
yeah, those are kind of like the big picture answers that I would have to those. Uh, thank you so much. I, I, I'd like to follow up since you just uh, uh, gave me some insight about the foreclosures. I think that foreclosure is something that we really, we really particularly coming off of 2008, in which we had a, a massive, uh, you know, really transfer of wealth and that happened in 2008 that people don't realize happened when there was a significant foreclosure that occurred in 2008. And we're still reaping the benefits of those, that massive transfer of wealth. And it went really from people of color to people who are uh, who are Caucasians. It, it was a massive transfer of wealth. We will look back years from now and look at that. And we're starting to uh, look at it with, uh, with respect to uh, uh, what we call gentrification and things of that nature, and particularly in our urban areas. So I think that we need to focus there. But And, and so if is it possible that you guys can look in the foreclosure. I think you had some 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 uh, 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 you know some access limitation problems. I think you're saying, uh, but is there any way that you can pursue the foreclosure issue at all to determine the inequities and the disparities that exist there? Um, I'll, I'll I'll say Ryan, and please feel free to jump in. I'll say that it is uh, something that we kind of potentially identify as, as something that we can look forward. I think that part of it is that because we know how the data limitations has been with like evictions, we don't, we want to be able to make sure that we have kind of like, I don't want to say we've solved because there's no way we're solving this issue with just having this conversation, but um, we've kind of like been involved in becoming this experience. So overall, this is data that I'm sure that long-term is something we're also challenging um, moving priorities, right? So we, with the fact that the moratoria keeps shifting, one moment we think that we have finalized data where we can make an inference, but the moment that it shifts now, we don't really know how that, that, that plays out. I do know that there's several groups that have some proprietary data out there. Um, but again, I think that this issue comes back to open access versus proprietary data, because if I can't afford it or I can't access it and I'm not an institution or a center that can afford it for me, how am I supposed to bring my different perspective? into what's happening and, and, and contribute to the knowledge. And I think that that's kind of like where we're at with that. So if it's something that we would be willing to approach and have a conversation to think about as like a next step for sure, I think. But overall, it's just, it's the concern is, well, we know that what we're gonna get is not gonna be complete. Or if we're gonna get there, it's gonna take way more longer than the time that it kind of might need to be able to prevent this. It might just be too long as, in, in that sense. So we're battling those kind of like uh, shifting dynamics, I think. Yeah, one of the things, that, and I'm gonna, and I appreciate that comment. One of the things that we do, and I res respond two ways with that. One of the things that we do is, a as we deal with the renter marketplace, and we move from, and there's nothing wrong with renters. There's nothing wrong with renters. But as we move to maybe a, a, a different form of stabilization of housing, maybe to home ownership, and we believe that that might be an effort to 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 stabilize home uh, uh, families. We, 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 if we don't correct the disparity there, then we're just shifting, you know, we're just shifting the issue. And ultimately we're going to have the same thing. We'll be back and we'll be back, but it'll, it won't be on renters. It'll be on homeowners because the same forces that impact here in, in the renting area will follow us there. So that's, that's one thing. And, and uh, I'm in healthcare. So I see unstabilized housing and unsafe and poor housing impacting uh, care so impactful. I wish, and, and what we're going to try to do is grab that data and sort of bring that to the forefront too, from, from K, meaning kindergarten, and, and now we're even moving into pre-K, where we can really determine the impact that it has on our families from a health perspective, not only physical, as you've said, Representative Johnson, but all the other myriad of things that we see. And I had an anecdotal story, but I don't want to take time to do that. But typically, if we have the data and the anecdotal story, we have the cognitive, which is the data, but the anecdotal, the anecdotal stories are the emotion that bring it together, that put a life around it. So both of those are important in terms of delivering the impact or the focus on something that needs to be changed. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Up next, we have Representative Michael Ramon. Thank you, Kendra. And, and uh, Melissa, I'm not, I'm not on the committee, so I was not sure that I was allowed to ask or make a comment, but I think there's something very relevant there. I'm sorry, Representative Ramon, if yeah. you could maybe get a little closer. 
it's not loud enough. Is that better? That's better. Okay. Um, I am not on the committee, so I was a little concerned whether I was allowed to participate, but there is something here uh, that I wanted to just bring up that I think is very relevant. First of all, Forrest uh, it has actually uh, spoken of the of, of a bigger problem that we need to resolve that hopefully when we fix that problem, these types of problems don't occur as frequently. But um, the the fact that we put this environment on the, the rental uh, world, it's very similar to, I don't know how many of you remember, I'm sure that uh, Senator Sokola remembers when, um, when Bo Biden got elected as AG was the first year that I got elected, that was 08. And Forrest, I think you were referring to this a little bit, you know, like six, seven, and eight, that, that mortgage chaos was horrific. And Bo, uh, Bo developed something out of the attorney general's office that he then came to, well, he actually came to me in the house to be a prime sponsor and, and someone on the other side in the house because he wanted a Republican and a Democrat because it was more than politics, it was about policy. And uh, what we did, I think was incredibly important, uh, although it didn't do as much as we wanted, it stopped the, 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 the peak of the bottom to the peak of the top and it kind of gave us a more uh, a gentle landing. And I think there's something like that that we're gonna have to do again right now because we've, we've held this off for so long uh, I think both Hector and, and Ryan, you guys are touching on something that's going to be catastrophic. There's going to be a lot of people whacked. And, and it's not just going to hit those who are, who are the tenants. It's, it's also going to hit uh, the landlords. They don't even realize it. But when you take that many out of the marketplace and you immediately try to displace them in a homeless world that can't absorb those kind of people right now, I think that's where Forrest's head's going. That's what he's saying. What are we doing? You know, we're not doing this the right way. So I don't know the answers. I really don't. But I do, I would strongly suggest maybe, maybe, uh, you know, Senator Sokola is pro temp and, and you know, Melissa and, and Kendra, maybe we look at Bo's bills and we just try to tweak them into something that could be done uh, as, a, as a state of legislation. And maybe we piggyback it with federal money from the CARES Act and we try to find a way to, to, to give a lifeline, to give people you know, a, a little bit of, of a lifeline. That helps, it helps the landlords and it helps the tenants uh, regroup. And that's a really big conversation. And it's something I'm, I'm, I'm just, I mean, I'm frustrated in myself because we've waited too long that this has been going on for a year now. And every month is worse than the previous month, both for the landlords and the tenants. And, and what we're creating is a, is a very deep hole that we're going to fall in unless we do something uh, important. And, and I, I really appreciate uh, Ryan and, and Hector at least trying to show the statistical information that shows the need because you know, Farsh, you said something really important that I always try to preach to my kids and everything when we're doing stuff. The most important th part of anything, any motivation, any getting anything done is the story. And, and I don't want to have to tell this story uh, of what's going to happen in two, three, six months to get something done. I hope we can tell the stories of what happened in the past with a different situation to make sure we don't repeat the same stupid mistakes. So that's me. That's my preaching, ladies. I'm sorry, but thank you for letting me speak and, and I, I almost feel like I'm going to be rude because I have to set up a meeting at seven for a community and I got about five minutes so I'm going to just listen for a couple minutes but if I jump off don't think it's because anybody hurt my feelings you can't hurt my feelings they've tried that before so but thank you um well thank you representative Ramon for your comments um we we may have to invite you to to join the membership of our subcommittee <laughs> Up next, uh, we have Ms. Lucretia Young. Hello, um, can you hear me? We can. Well, first of all, I just wanna commend the task force for bringing this listening session to the table. It's a very important conversation. There are a lot of arms and legs that are gonna grow out of this. Um, I, I know some of you haven't met all of you. I am the state director for AARP Delaware. And so all of these issues are very concerning to us nationwide as a, um, major organization and within the state of Delaware. With that said, I just wanted to ask um, 
first come in, Ryan and Hector, for your great work. I know that the data is there, right? There's so much of it, so many slices. I was wondering if you had the opportunity to do any slices around older populations, especially 50, 64 year old populations, which are the greatest at risk because they're ones that are losing their jobs, become economically insecure, may not be as employable because of skill sets. And of course we have um, um, all types of um, issues when it comes to folks um, even being interested in, in hiring older folks. So the first one is have we done that? Also, have we looked at anything around evictions and institutionalization? Um, we know that um, at ARP, we know the top four reasons why people are institutionalized besides uh, our um, urinary incontinence, Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, and then an inability to age at home. And there's a lot of reasons why folks don't get to age at home. One may be because they don't have a home, so they're homeless and then they become institutionalized. So there's a lot of data and information on that. And not knowing all of the, um, the, the, the bottom line on why you brought them to the table to do this particular cut, this data, and I do want to sit back and listen more. I'm just wondering if these items were or, or are going to be part of the data set eventually. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate um, both comments and questions. Um, I guess that I, I, I'll say a couple of things. Um, let me make sure that I captured everything. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, first, I wanted to talk about aging populations and, 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 and kind of like that, that idea. Part of, of, of what we've taken some, some perspective. I, just wanna, I do want to mention that a lot of the population data we're overlaying is from the American Community Survey 2019. So of course, um, what we're using is at a lot larger level. So we don't have access at an individual level or at a specific, I guess, let's say target population level. Um, but overall, what I think that not directly. So no, we necessarily, we haven't evaluated at what, what individuals have the highest frequency and, and, and of, of eviction filing. I think that part of the challenges are that even if we have that historical information because of the nature of, of, of the 2020 um, physical, I guess, manifestation of the eviction courts. One of those things is like, for example, I, I'm mentioning that because access to internet, for example, individuals that have access to internet throughout the pandemic had access to file evictions from home um, or in a, a, a online, but the populations that have access to those resources are not necessarily the same. And through some inspection of the state, we do know that populations at age have lower access to broadband internet. So it's not just a matter of housing, it's also a matter of like resources around that. So. Yes, because at the same time, I may be an individual that needs to have telemedicine at home, and that's still a housing security circumstance throughout a pandemic. So if I don't have access to the internet, then I already substantially don't have access to those resources that I can't go to the doctor necessarily, and it might not be safe for me to be in the ER, et cetera. So I think that there's also like many of those digital divide challenges that are, are facing. So on that land, I want to say that somewhat knowledge, but not directly. I think that Ryan uh, could contribute, if anything that I missed, but overall, um, where we're at in terms of what's happening with eviction filings is that we, we know that any conclusions that we make about filings are just not going to be 100% capturing what's happening with evictions. So I think that the part that we're trying to balance is refining that knowledge of the data that already exists and like refining what it best represents or moving forward with what summaries and uh, inferences we have and overlaying data forward. So Big picture, not necessarily something that we've not thought about um, and would consider an open dialogue about. I think that, again, it's just a matter of like, well, how useful would this data be to even overlay on top of if it's just not going to represent what's necessarily um, capturing there? Um, but that's at least what I have there. Yeah, I, I understand. Um, I just want to, if I could just follow up by saying that the, a lot of the conversation was around disparities in African-Americans. And we, as African-Americans, we are institutionalized more often. And the evictions are great. Um, a lot of that happens to have to occur when we're older. So I'm just wondering, is there a place there that you're looking at that when you're, when you're starting to discuss building out a solution? It's all of that data, I would think, needs to be at the table. And I understand where you're getting your data from. I'm just wondering if there is, is another cut that you can have eventually, but. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, I, and I, I think that I, I appreciate for sure, definitely um, the, the, the kind of like intersectionalities for those. One of the things that I'll add is that some of the information that we've tried looking at is from the House Pulse Survey, um, which has been collected kind of substantially throughout the pandemic. And with some intersection of what's happened in the most recent weeks, there is the 
um, an older population, the that is a divorced population, happens to be at most risk of perceiving that they will have evictions. So there's that other layer of like there's perception of eviction, not necessarily if they're going to be evicted, but that data, different type of survey and <laughs> access to data is not meant to be like it's based on on different things, but we can make some conclusions as to what's there. Um, it's just that right now, I think that part of that question is like, is that data from the house poll survey something that might be the best thing to overlay over this based on a, all the things that are going on? Um, not that it's not and that we're trying to prioritize what's important. It's just that we also know that that data is not, they even make the caveats of this is not necessarily representative. It's a different year and stuff of the sort. So I think that all this is being parts for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, I see uh, Representative Ramon said he, he waved and he disappeared. He just kind of just disappeared into the universe. Um, at this time, I do not see any additional raised hands. I'm taking my time. I'm scanning because I have been known to miss things from time to time. I do not see any additional raised hands. Uh, Ryan and Hector and all of your team members that support you uh, to make this happen and to be able to provide us with this presentation. Thank you so much. It is really appreciated. I love how the universe conspires and just kind of puts people together because Janie and I just kind of collided and one thing, you know, turned into another. And then, you know, Representative Minor Brown and I were all talking and then here you guys are providing us with our very first listening session. So I am so very, so very grateful um, for the work that you've done and uh, for you being here with us this evening and providing us with this presentation and giving us more things to, um, to evaluate. And like I said, I look forward to sitting back, reviewing your presentation and clicking the links so that I can get the full experience. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time, your talents and your expertise. You are appreciated. So, so Kendra, I just wanna say thank you so much for having us this evening um, and giving us this opportunity. <laughs> To, yeah, I'm here and, and uh, you know, for the opportunity to, to share these very important findings with all of you. Um, you know, our, our goal at DDIL is really to, you know, produce data that is relevant and that will help impact our communities. Um, and, um, you know, just having the ability to share this with you all this evening has been amazing um, because I know that this committee will kind of take what we've shared and, and make important policy out of it. So thank you. Well, it is our pleasure. Thank you all for your time. Okay. So I will go ahead and close the participants list now. And we have just completed our listening session. So we can move on now to our resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis. Um, Representative Minor Brown, would you like me to continue to talk or do you wanna take this one over? Thanks Representative Johnson. You can actually take this one over. I actually, um, okay. I a note to myself as I was making notes about um, the presentation that um, Hector and Ryan uh, presented to us. And Lucretia, when she mentioned seniors, you know, I, I thought back to when I was a nurse case manager out in the field and I came across a lot of seniors that um, either rented or owned homes that were unsafe to live in. And some that were really at the point where they needed to be condemned. And sometimes when a senior is living in a home like that, they will be fined for not keeping the house up or that home will be taken from them. Or if they're renting, they can be evicted and some don't have family. So I just want us to think about that as we work towards um, 
looking at evictions and, and how we can ensure that individuals, um, you know, are not left out on the street. Thinking about our seniors who may not have family to, to take them in or to help them with, uh, get connected to resources. So, you know, also that, you know, and when you think about that, you have to think about the accountability that um, needs to, to be on the, the landlord as well. So it's just something I was thinking about as we were talking, it's a really sad situation, but I just want us to think about that as we move towards creating policy to protect our senior population as well. Um, but <laughs> in reference to um, our resolution, um, I, I don't mind just giving the update. First, let me just thank our uh, subcommittee members for all of your recommendations. Uh, we got word changes. We got um, sentences to add. We've got sentences to remove. We've got whole clauses to include. And all of this just really strengthens this very, very important resolution. So Representative Johnson and I are working to include all of that in this resolution. So at the moment it is not finished, but it will be soon. And when it is done, our question to you is, would you like to review this as a whole, as a group prior to Representative Johnson and I um, filing this resolution or with all of the additional changes is the group, um, would the group be okay with us um, moving forward with filing it? And it's really up to you because this isn't just Representative Johnson, Representative Johnson and I's resolution. This is the health and welfare subcommittee's resolution. So this is all of our resolution. Um, oh, I see some hands raised. I don't know which one came <laughs> first? So I'm going to go in the order in which I see them, which is uh, Debbie Harrington. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Representative Maya Brown. Uh, no, I just wanted to comment. There were uh, some great changes, those that I did see, and I'm sure there are some that I didn't see. And um, so for that reason, I would prefer that we, that you just bring it back to us so that we can just review it as a whole now with, with everyone's comments in them. And uh, because I mean, some comments, I, you know, I didn't even put in because there were so many others. So and I, I figured it my the things that I were think I was thinking was was covered. So just to make sure that all those bases are covered, I think it would be really helpful to you guys as well uh, to have us look at the document before you send it in. Thank you, Senator Sokola. Sorry about that, the phone was ringing and I wanted to hold off a second. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Am I okay, good, good. I, um, I'll make, um, I'll admit something here today. Um, two years ago when she was running a bill on um, healthy drinks, I fell in love with uh, Representative Minor Brown <laughs> because she got a letter of opposition that I felt clearly had some racial overtones to it. And she handled it with such grace and intellect. And uh, yeah, I just felt that this, this is somebody who's terrific. And, and whatever your judgment is on wordsmithing this, I will trust um, as, a, as a member of the public, not as a member of the committee here, because uh, I'm not on the committee. But um, I thought of you this morning, Mimi, when I saw an interview with uh, an author named Heather McGee, who wrote a book called The Sum of Us, what racism costs everyone and how we can prosper together. And, and, and here in her interview, I, I had to buy the book. <laughs> so, but, um, but, but she said things that are directly about what we're talking about here. And, um, and, and, and there's some bias that goes beyond race. It's just bias against people who are low income or poor, regardless of race. And, um, and, and I think that, um, I think that this is something that has so many um, components to it, but a lot of it has to do with economic decisions that we made. And she talked about a few of them and I just can't remember exactly, but, but it was very persuasive um, to me. And, and you know, one of the things that we know over the last 40 years, worker productivity has shot through the roof and worker pay has not. And, and what we have is a system that has 
caused money to go uh, from people who are doing the work and being productive to people who are connected either by patent or trademarks or intellectual property, all of which they should be protected. But the reason they should be protected is so that we can all benefit. And right now that's not what's happening. Um, so I just wanted to thank the committee for their work and, and look forward to uh, your finished product because I, I have a tremendous amount of confidence that it will be excellent. So. Senator Sokola, thank you so much for your kind words and thank you for your, your comments. Um, I really appreciate it. And yes, member of the public, but you are welcome to join the subcommittee. Um, also, that book, I would love to, if you could just take a picture of it and send it to me because it sounds like something I wouldn't mind purchasing. But thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, Mr. Watson. Uh, I'm going to echo a, a lot of what the Senator has just mentioned, particularly about Representative Minor Brown, um, who is uh, a, just a, a real irritant. And, uh, and I think that's a, uh, in, in the uh, words of uh, Representative John Lewis, uh, gets into that good trouble. Good trouble. And uh, so I will say that, and, uh, and her uh, continuous agitation is, is, is caused <laughs> great things. Um, one of the things that I noted um, when, uh, you know, I, and I, I tried to, to put some reflections on your, your uh, resolution, and as I reflected on it, I, I couldn't, I, it would, I had changed it too much. So I didn't, I didn't wanna do that. So uh, I wrote something which I thought uh, over the years that I've lived and researched and read about that sort of just popped into my heart that sort of uh, crystallizes all of the things that I've tried to put my hand on uh, over the years regarding this thing called racism in the American experiment. And I'm a real advocate of the American experiment. I think it's, it's just wonderful. I wouldn't be sitting here today had not it been for the American experiment and so many other uh, people of color, and not just people of color, but all people who have this experience, uh, being educated or had an opportunity to educate it come in the course of the poll, uh, you know, and those kinds of things. I'm sitting here as evidence of that. Uh, but I also know when I was younger, and I make this note, when I was younger, I often wondered why uh, in, in the community that I, I didn't realize it was the ghetto at the time. To me, it was just my community and it was where people uh, and, and that we knew and were related to and we all were similarly situated. Um, uh, and, I, and I'll say this because it just, this is, 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 is you'll, you'll hear what I'm saying. Uh, it, traditionally in the black community, I grew up in upstate New York in Rochester, New York. And um, even though I'm from Georgia, so I didn't realize why I was in, in New York in that cold. Um, and so, but in that community, right next to our community were, were, were four real communities all packed together. Uh, it was the Italian community, which represented probably the largest uh, ethnic group right next to the African-American community. And then there was the, uh, that I know that was demonstrative was the, uh, um, uh, the Latino community, the, uh, which was right next to and then there were mismatched, which I consider uh, people with Polish names right next to that community. And so that was in the 50s and the 60s. And I noted that uh, in our community, particularly, although we live pretty, pretty well, there was still a lot of dilapidation going on in those communities that were highly well maintained. But there was parts of the community that was really, really well kept. And I just wondered why in the world that those places uh, were well kept and the rest of us uh, weren't. And um, another thing I noted is that in our community, particularly in the African-American community, uh, you know, we drove some really fine cars, but we lived in some really dilapidated locations. And I, and I wanted, and, and, I, and I was, I, I condemned that when I was younger because I didn't understand. Uh, that, you know, redlining and things of that nature. When I got older, I understood why it was 
it was it was it was it, the financial system rewarded uh, or gave uh, auto loans, but wouldn't give home loans. Uh, so I, I understood that then, but I didn't. I mean now, but not back then. But one of the things I realized is I didn't know anything about finances, and finances was crippling our, uh, our community. And so what I decided to do when I went to college is I'm going to learn finance. I don't know anything about it. And, and as a result of being on that track, I arrived at this, this, this definition of what I think is racism, because I see everything points back to this. And so I hope that when we go forward, I get a chance to share a little bit more about why I think it's so embedded in things and why things like white supremacy doctrine, socialization and segregation uh, perpetuates this system in terms of uh, separating uh, people who have, uh, you know, uh, same economic interests, but separating them to so that we're, they're actually almost enemies. And, and so there's a system that does that. And so we need to recognize there's a system that's doing that. Um, uh, you know, uh, and, I, and, I, and, and, and we have all have to work together to, to, to identify that system, confront that system and change it because it's impacting all of us in this United States. So I'd like to see your reflections in your new uh, resolution. And I'd like to see it, to, to see if we could come to this in, in a way that we don't just do low hanging fruit, but we get to some of this root cause. I think we've got the greatest opportunity in the history of America to do this today. I'm so encouraged at one side, but at the other side, uh, uh, you know, so uh, uh, you know, concerned at the same time. But I think this is the greatest opportunity since the Civil War, actually. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. It, it, it's so funny too, you mentioned that good trouble. I um, actually started a little bit of that today. I know you're behind the, uh, the elementary school wellness centers and I was a little disappointed when I, we realizing that we still don't have one, uh, a, a um, wellness center for the children that are at the Hope Center, which is the homeless shelter here in my district. So. You know, we can't we can't say that funding is an issue because we either pay on the front end or we pay on the back end. And, you know, it, it's it's easier to just use early intervention than pay $40,000 a year to house someone in prison. So we have to work on that. Um, but thank you so much. That That is so important. And you, I mean, you, this whole committee, we just get great information just deep 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 we just dive deep into it and I just I just love the subcommittee so much we are in the right place rep Johnson <laughs> we got the best subcommittee I'm sorry I just recorded isn't it <laughs> I started the meeting letting Senator Socola know that he was in the presence of the best subcommittee so you're it's in the right place that we should end in that way as well <laughs> yes so we will ensure that once the resolution is um, complete, when, once the draft is complete, we will bring it before the subcommittee for your feedback. And if we have to move some things around or, or make other edits, we will, so that we can make sure that this resolution is, is what it needs to be before it is filed. Because once it's filed and it goes into the record, it's in the record. So thank you guys so much for that. Are there any other questions or comments uh, regarding the, the resolution? Okay, um, next on the agenda is the Q&A for task force members. Are there any questions, comments, concerns, suggestions from anyone on the task force? I think we don't, hi. I think we only have one more meeting set up. Am I correct? I think we're set up through March. Dr. Carmen, you know that's your job to set up the meeting. <laughs> it is our job. It really is. I thought we were set up. <laughs> I, 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 I knew you were going to uh, gonna ask me that, so I figured I would probably go ahead and uh, <laughs> I don't see anything in April. Am I? Um... Looks like we stop at 318. Yeah. Okay. So I, I just thought I'd bring oh, that to no, the table. Actually, I had April of 15. Do you? Okay. Yeah, I did. I had April oh, yep, 15 okay. on Thursday. Yeah. Hey, thank okay. you, Dr. Debbie, because I'm like, oh, I, I messed up. Okay. Yeah. And in uh, March, we have several birthdays. <clears throat> I wrote it down in my calendar because we were talking about it. <laughs> 
I think we have a date. Is it on on um, Carmen's birthday or? We we do, we do have a that, birthday. I, but look, let me get my actual put my notes. Oh. Yes, I'm going back through my notes, and if we don't have a date, we can definitely do it now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So our March meeting is on the 18th. Okay. All right. All right. Oh, I have 415. Yeah, I thought yeah. We right. April 15th. That's what I have. The 15th. Oh, right. But the March, so we have March 18th and, yes. and April. And the April 15th. 15th. Okay. Yeah. And that's where we stop. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 we have to go back and look at it because I actually have. May 20th also, but All right, I don't know if up. I just put that there. I don't know if I put that May there because we were doing them on Thursdays or not, but I do have May 20th. Third Thursday. So yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have May 20th on the calendar. Yeah, so, so, so I, I may have just put that there, keeping in keeping with Thursdays, that's it, the third Thursday. So did we want to commit to that? I just. We usually try to do a couple months out, several months out. That was the reason I mentioned it, so. Are there any objections from the group to continue with the, the every third Thursday mm -hmm. of the month? I hear no objection. I see Rep Johnson looking through her notes. Yeah. yeah. Thursdays can be session days. That was what it was. That's exactly right. right. That's yes. Yes. That's you said problem. that. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. See, yes. Senator Thank Cicola, you. that was the reason why. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. That was that was the fear um that we we had when we actually got started. It's like, oh my goodness, what if um we end up having um you know having to go into session and cancel um a meeting. So yeah, we, we probably um, need to pick a different day. Ugh. Which would probably mean Mondays would be the days when you would not, because you're in, okay? Yeah, so session is Tuesday, Thursday, committee Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So that would be Monday evening would be the only day that you're not, well, since I assume you're not gonna, I assume that people would not wanna do Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, this person does not put it out there into the universe, just putting it out there. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Rep Minor Brown, what do you what do you what do you think about Wednesdays? Um, I'm open to Wednesdays if the committee is open to Wednesdays. I prefer Wednesday over Monday only because I will be um, in my car in this meeting if we do Monday. I have a little oh. one as back to back dance classes on Monday evenings. Yeah, you do, don't you, ma'am? Um, How about Wednesday, the 19th of May? Does that work for the committee? Wednesday, the 18th? That will be the third Wednesday. Any objections to that? 5-18. So, and I know we don't have the entire committee here, but then looking at June, that would be June 15. Uh, June 16th, I think. 16, uh, yes, you're right, June 16th. And let me ask then after June, do we want to go back to Thursday or we want to stay at Wednesday? Maybe we can have that conversation in May. Okay. Yeah. In May? <laughs> okay, that's fine. That's Carmen. I like to schedule things out too. I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe by then, uh, X number of millions of people would have had the, had been vaccinated and people might want to do something else. How, about that? That. How yeah. about that? Yes. Speak it into the universe, Dr. Corman. Speak it. <laughs> All right. Just waiting, just waiting to get my second shot. So wonderful. 
Okay, so we have May the 18th and we have June the 16th. Same time, 5.30? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right, well, wow. Glad we got that taken care of, that's good. Yes, it is. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I did have a question about the listening session. First of all, I just want to say that tonight was just wonderful and uh, they did a spectacular job on the housing. And just a remind, it, it was a reminder of, um, you know, that housing is even connected to um, health disparities. So that was perfect. So I, what I, my question is whether or not we are uh, doing the listening session for the next one and uh, if we already know the topic. So Representative Minor Brown and I, we've been throwing a lot of different topics around. We have to, she and I have to connect again so that we can figure it out. What we, what we agreed on and what we felt was best, like tonight we had the listening session during our actual subcommittee meeting. We felt that's the best way to do it to, so that we're not trying to find another day. Um, what we also know is that the data lab, they have information on um, FASFAs and something else. What else is it? Something else. So they are, and I cannot, it's escaping me at the moment. They are also, um, they've agreed to provide listening sessions on that as well, because the FAFSAs relate to education. And yep. I Ken other Kendra. Oh, Kendra. there you are. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm still, I'm still lurking out here. Um, oh. um, so the oh, other, the yeah. other, the other, I think, is really impactful. It's around healthy communities and social determinants of health, Thanks. and what we and what we found um, in Delaware around um, social determinants of health. Awesome, thank you, Janie. I'm I'm almost feeling, you know, like Janie just she just appears out of nowhere. I'm like, oh, and I can't remember. She's like, wait, I'm here. I have it for you. So. So Rep. Minor Brown and I have to do a little bit more discussing uh, because the other thing we thought as well was, you know, if when with our next listening session, like how many other expert subject matter experts would we want to bring in? Um, so give us some time and we'll be, Rep. Minor Brown, we'll be prepared to, to give you guys a listening schedule next meeting. Crossing my fingers. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we'll work on it. Thanks, Amy. Are we going to be able to get the PowerPoint? Uh, yes. I will have Sophia send it out to everyone. Okay. And, and the link that was in that. Right. I think it's embedded in there. Right. Yeah, That's so what I was thinking. You can hit it right yeah in the video you probably could tap it but it oh we've seen it yeah. anyway, we just need to you, you can yes you you yeah. can it's embedded okay. in the powerpoint and you can okay. and see the the full uh, visualization oh that'll be i'll enjoy that yeah great wonderful thank, thank you it was it was a great presentation thank you very much <laughs> oh my goodness uh, thank you we were delighted to be able to present Thank you. Indeed, indeed. All right, Rep. Johnson, so we have our upcoming meetings scheduled. Yes. What is next on our agenda, if anything? Did we reach out to the public for public comment? We, we did not. I guess it is time for public comments. Um, right now, we have one public attendee. Mm -hmm. um, if anyone would like to make a public comment, please use the raise hand function to indicate you would like to speak. At this point, no one has indicated they would like to make a public comment. Please use the raise hand function if anyone changes their mind. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. So uh, Representative Minor Brown, it seems that we have no public comments at this time. 
I guess you can move towards um, wrapping us up. What do you think about that, huh? Sounds good. You know, I always, even though this is like right in the middle of dinner time and bath time and all that good stuff, I really do kind of get a little bit sad when it's time to leave this group. And I can't <laughs> wait till the day that we can actually meet in person. I know, I know. And, and hug, like meet, hug. So just so you all know, I'm a hugger. All right, so if you're not a hugger, please let me know in advance so that once we all get our vaccinations, I don't come running to you with my arms open wide. That's gonna be that's gonna be 2024, so it'll be a long time. I can't wait, Kendra. <laughs> my first hug is coming to you, Senator. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's safer to hug than to shake hands, guys. Think about it. We have to ask Dr. Fauci about that. <laughs> I don't know what you've been touching, but I can, you know. <laughs> anyway, all right. Does anyone have any other? Uh, Mr. Watson, did you have a question? Oh, no, no. Okay. If there are no other questions or um, comments, concerns from the group, then we can say goodnight. Yeah, so uh, I'm guessing then this meeting is adjourned. Um, Thank you, everyone, for being here. Good night. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. Take care, on guys. To, on to the Bye, next meeting.